Blog Talk Radio. Well, folks, welcome to another edition of Move to Men Reports. I am Egberto Ruiz, and... and I'm Keon Bliss, going in again to suffer for Laura. Uh, well, actually, Keon is, has been subbing for either Laura and myself for quite some time now, and we've been so happy to have him help us out with the show. How is it going out there, Keon? Doing quite well. Uh, the weather out here is wonderful. Uh, finally got over our uh, recent cold snap that we had last week. Fortunately, I happened to be down in sunny Florida during the time, so I got back in just in time for 80-degree weather. Well, good for you. Good for you. But let's, all, let's get started. Folks, we have a great guest for you tonight. It's Gar Alperovitz. Is the founder of the Democracy Collaborative and Lionel Bauman, professor of political economy and the universe, at the University of Maryland. He is a former fellow of the Institute of Politics at Harvard and of King's College at Cambridge University, where he earned his PhD in political economy. He has served as a legislative director in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, and as a special assistant in the Department of State. Earlier, he was president of the Center of Community Economic Development, co-director of the Cambridge Institute, and president of the Center for the Study of Public Policy. Dr. Alperovitz, numerous articles have appeared in publications ranging from the New York Times, and the Washington Post to the Journal of Economic Issues, Foreign Policy, Diplomatic History, and other academic and popular journals. Dr. Alperovitz is the author of Making a Place for Community, Local Democracy in a Global Era, published in 2002 with Stan Williamson and David Mbrusio. Probably said that wrong. He's also the author of Unjust Deserts, Lou Daly in 2008, and America Beyond Capitalism in 2011. Last year, he released his new book, What Must We Do Then?, and the new film, The Next American Revolution. Dr. Gaur Alperovitz, it's an honor to have you on our show here at Move to Amend Reports. Dr. Ralph Roberts. Hello. Thanks. Thanks yes, very much you. for having me. Absolutely. Yes. Sir, Kian has a few questions for you, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Ralph Purvis, it's a pleasure to have you join us tonight. Uh, before we bring up Dr. Ralph Purvis, we just want to uh, remind everyone that uh, if you have a question or a comment for uh, for Garth, please dial 646-652-2345. And press one after the prompt. Now, Dr. Alperovitz, uh, we know you've been busy since the release of your book, What Must We Do Then, and its companion documentary, The Next American Revolution. It's been hailed by dozens of prominent activists within the broader movement for democracy, including Daniel Ellsberg, who describes your book as the most serious, intellectually grounded strategy for system changing yet to appear. 
can you please briefly to tell us about our current place in history as from your perspective in the book? Oh, that's a, a good and long question. Um, I think we are at a point where the old ways of doing things are obviously, to many people, fading away in their effectiveness. <clears throat> that income distribution is getting worse, inequality is growing, uh, poverty is growing, ecological disaster is uh, you know, occurring in many places, climate change being the most obvious threat. Uh, we're seeing uh, racial difficulties, including getting folks away from the uh, co polls, that finding different ways to keep people from voting, uh, Internet kind of circulation and spying is growing. The government is encroaching in many different areas. Uh, corporate power is, is becoming ever more egregious in Washington, money talks. What I think, in one sense, none of this is new, except that it's growing more in intensity. But on the other hand, I think people are waking up to it and becoming more and more aware that something is really wrong. And, and I think it goes well beyond uh, electing Democrats or Republicans. It's it's a systemic um, difficulty buried deep within the heart of the system. So I think that's new in, in American history, or at least for the most part, that people are beginning to grasp something uh, something is really uh, needs to be looked at in a deeper and deeper way. And on the other hand, um, although the press doesn't cover it because most of it is happening at the local level, there's also an extraordinary bubbling up of new thinking and new ideas, and particularly in the uh, economic area where the idea of changing who owns the wealth uh, is beginning to grow up. There are some 10,000 companies that are owned by workers rather than corporations. Uh, for instance, most people don't know that. There are 11 million people involved. There are co-ops developing. There are land trusts. Uh, City-owned things are developing. A lot of it because of the pain levels. So uh, as the pain grows, people can't get solutions in the old way, and they're exploring uh, very, very interesting new directions that point towards uh, uh, much more democratic forms of uh, economic activity uh, at the grassroots level. So I think the, the real question is uh, whether as the you know, systemic crisis deepens and as the pain levels grow, uh, whether people begin to learn more and build a new politics around a very different direction uh, in a pragmatic uh, but but very serious way. Absolutely right. I mean, is, would you say that from this place, uh, from this current place in our history, that uh, it's time, it, the time is right to start a movement that transforms our uh, from transforms our economy from corporate capitalism into something more egalitarian, more democratic? Uh, I think I think the time has long been, you know, right for that, <laughs> but I also think the time is uh, propitious in the sense that more and more people are, you know, coming to the conclusion that there really is a, a time to do this. You know, for a long time in American history, people thought the choice was between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and I think many people see that's a, kind of a dead end. Uh, I've I, would rather have most Democrats in office because they're slightly better. But the big, big trends keep getting worse no matter who's in office. And, you know, income distribution gets worse. The top 1% has gone from 10% of the income to over 22%. Uh, but it, Democrats and Republicans don't alter the trend. Uh, the, the climate crisis has gotten worse no matter who's in office. Uh, spying, and uh, that is government spying on people, has gotten worse no matter who's in office. So I think that's reaching people in a new way that certainly in my life, uh, even in the 1960s, uh, I think the awareness that something was really profoundly wrong uh, was not this deep. So it is time, I think, uh, not only to, to get to get very serious about what would it take really to transform the political economic system. Uh, most people, you know, think that's impossible, uh, and they kind of sh kind of think what. what Changing the system? Are you? Are you? You know, that's that, that's really too far. But you know, historically, systems come and go all the time. The, you know, the Berlin Wall collapsed, the Soviet Union collapsed, apartheid collapsed. Uh, we forget that a bunch of farmers and merchants, small-scale merchants, took on the British Empire, the most powerful empire in the world, and and won. Um, women's triumphed in the, the feminist movement in the United States, which is 
probably the most important cultural revolution in modern history, changing relationships between men and women is extraordinarily difficult culturally, and that's radically altered. Gay rights is radically altered. So civil rights, you know, in the South in the 1940s, 50s, even good part of the 60s, but certainly before that, if you tried to change anything, you were not only up against the system, you were up against probably being hung from a tree and murdered. But, and yet people <laughs> yes, were able were. to achieve people were able to achieve the change so i am i am not a utopian optimist but i also i am a historian and what i know is that uh, most people don't recognize the possibility of change but in fact it's often uh, beginning to bubble below the surface uh and and that the times begin to you know the pain levels or the disillusionment happens and then more and more people begin to get into the act and they surprise themselves with how much power that is possible to build if if people are serious. Um, do you think that there are still existing structures within the U.S. economy that can that are still democratic or uh, can be salvage or salvageable uh, in this transition? Oh, definitely. That's what's interesting about the United States. Um, the if you actually look below the surface. There are, uh, and I did this in the book, the new book, What Then Must We Do? I tried to catalog some of the things that are really happening that you don't see reported on uh, in the newspapers, not partly because, you know, some of the conservative owners don't want to do it, but mainly because newspapers are in such great difficulty that they, they don't, they can't afford reporting on local developments, uh, so they just, you just don't see it. But we do research on it. So some just some things to know about. 140 million Americans are members of co-ops. Now, that's a huge, 40% of the population actually already has some experience in the democratically owned uh, institution. A good part of that is uh, credit unions, which are publicly owned uh, or democratically owned banks, one person, one vote. Uh, For the most part, credit unions are very kind of conventional institutions, but within the credit union movement, there are also people trying to transform kind of a boring old institution into a much more creative bank that can help finance uh, new economic worker-owned companies and new economic activities uh, so that there's a movement within to reform an existing democratic banking structure that is very powerful. If you put all the credit unions together, you've got as much capital as any one of the big five New York banks that cause so much trouble, the tr- over a trillion dollars. And it's out there, can available. So here's another example: twenty-five um, percent of American electricity uh, is handled by essentially socialist system. Now, that's a funny word for it, but municipal enterprise uh, or co-ops, electrical co-ops, have twenty-five percent of the electricity in, in the United States. Uh, and even within that, we are seeing in Boulder, Colorado, just municipalized an existing private. A utility because they wanted to change the way it operated to a more climate respecting activities um, so that's another example of, of beginning to move out from where we now are uh, if you if you look carefully you, you know you find 20 states have introduced legislation that what to replicate for their state the existing Bank of North Dakota which is a publicly owned bank right which makes so they're there you know everywhere you actually look and, and as I say a report on this in in my book, uh, what what then must we do? Uh, there's a whole lot going on that can it already exists and that can be built on as precedents that are very practical and very uh, meaningful. So I think this is this is the first step of what needs to happen. I think is people beginning to act at the very grassroots level and and learning more about how to do these things so we can take it to the next state level and the regional level and national level, um, applying the same principles over time. Um, Dr. Provitz, it's interesting that I want to kind of get back on the inequality issue because a few months ago I was reading an article by Ezra Klein um, and I, I want to quote it because I want to be specific and it said the following. It's increasingly clear that the organization, that the organizing economic concern of the American left is or is becoming income inequality. It's the issue that led protesters to occupy the credit park it's the anxiety that powered Bill de Blasio's campaign for mayor of New York. Last week, President Obama called it, and the decline in social mobility it heralds 
the defining challenge of our time. Income inequality is easy to worry about. It offends our moral in intuitions. It tears into the fabric of the American dream. What we're all that we are all created equal is the opening line in the American story, Obama said. And while we don't promise equal outcomes, we strive to deliver equal opportunity. But is inequality really the country's most pressing problem? Imagine you were given a choice between reducing income inequality by 50% and reducing unemployment by 50%. Which would you choose? Sir, why must both welcome and income inequality be addressed to ensure a sustainable economy and democracy? I ask that because there's a lot of this kind of a thinking that's going on out there. Well, <laughs> that's a big question, but it's it's very important. That is, we know from many, many, many studies, but we also know from common experience and common sense that if you're if you have you know if you've got a lot of money and the education and time, your influence on politics is extraordinary. You can know how to you go to meetings, you pay congressmen, you contribute to congressmen. Your concerns are given first place. If you don't, if you are either low income or poor, just forget about it. You're you you are kind of a cipher that doesn't really count in the political uh calculation of most politicians. So the corporations on the one hand and people money on the other, um, you know, you can exaggerate this, but there are many studies that demonstrate the extraordinary power um uh, that goes with money. And it's not only power to convince a congressman or a senator or a president to kind of vote or support something. It's much more insidious. It's the power to define what gets up for decision. It's right. what the what political scientists call agenda setting. So that you can get your question on the table, um and your question might be, you know, as as we see now the oil the oil companies want their big concern is whether or not they can continue operating, you know, and fracking, and whether or not they can continue polluting the air with various pollutants that come out of their system, they can get that on the agenda and keep you off the agenda. Um, that's a, it's just a natural capacity that goes along with the power they have. Or the banking banking interests have been able to keep off really tight regulation. We're back at most bank most experts think in many areas we're back to the same kind of speculation that got us in trouble the last time around. And you can't get your ideas really into the heart of the system, uh, let alone getting votes on it, which is a whole lobbying structure. Now again this can be exaggerated and I'm trying I'm probably oversimplifying it for the purpose of this conversation, but the basic point is is well understood by political scientists. Uh, and a very important point that that money, you know, money talks in politics, and it talks pretty loudly. Absolutely. Now, what's interesting is um, um, many people, I think, come to that realization or or or, or adapt the Ezra Klein type realization because they're fearful of this word redistribution. So, my question to you is, what might a strategy look like? that goes beyond redistribution and managing equality. In other words, also, how can we uh, get the fear or the, the, the fear of that particular word mitigated? Which, which particular word? Redistribution. Well, it's... The, the way it's done is is uh, you know pretty straightforward in all movements because they all have f fears about what the words are or the the strategy is and you know think about civil rights or feminist movement or the, or the gay rights movement the way it's done is steady build up of the alternative ideas over time step by step with explosions here and there like like occupy occurred and recruiting more and more people to changing their view of what's important as time goes on. Um, you know, I'm the explosions do happen. Uh, I'm from Wisconsin, and I grew up in the period when uh, Senator Joe McCarthy, who you know was a really virulent yeah. force, attacking anybody who was even mildly left of center. Uh, so they saw communists under every under every bed. You know, he was, and people were frightened, frightened all over the country to say anything. 
And but in Wisconsin, where I lived, since he was a senator from Wisconsin, it was ten times as bad because he was so you know targeted on the state as well. So if you actually believed that you could, you know, anything could change, that there could be a more progressive possibility uh, at that time, and and if you lived in Wisconsin when McCarthy was there. Well, people thought you were really crazy to think that change could occur. It was just so obvious that it was, you know, anything that politically positive or progressive would happen seemed totally impossible. And and if you ask the conventional wisdom, and, you know, people need to think about this in our own time. The conventional wisdom was, oh, well, they're so powerful, nothing can be done. Well, what happened in the 1960s was everything exploded and no one had predicted it. Because right. people down, you know, beneath the surface, there were a lot of people who were very discontent. And even though at one level it looked like nothing was possible, things were brewing that the, certainly the newspapers didn't pick up and the pundits didn't pick up, but actually led to massive change. And that's a very, very common phenomenon around the world in world history that uh, things pop up be- that are unpredicted, and particularly by the establishment and, and by the the academics who, who always need to ten studies. You know, I'm, a, I'm a professor, but who need ten studies <laughs> to prove something before they can act. Um, in fact, you find things pop up and explode, and if people actually take a stand. Excellent. I'm going to kind of put you in the spot here. What kind of system would you operate uh, to produce a more egalitarian to produce more egalitarian outcome? No, I don't. That, that doesn't put me on the spot at all. That's something I spend a lot of time thinking about because I think. So let me say, I really appreciate the question, because most people don't actually ask that question in a straightforward way, because they don't think you can change the system. And one of the reasons they don't think you can change the system is they think everything's too powerful. Well, you know, as I say, that may or may not happen. It may be impossible, but we know from a lot of examples that it's actually an illusion that. People can't act, and people can act in many cases demonstrably. So we'll see about that. That's something you can test by your own willingness to organize and get out and do what the civil rights people did or the feminists did or the gay rights people did or the apartheid people, anti-apartheid people. So that's in our hands to test whether or not it's possible to change. But one of the things that really stands in the way, and this is back to your question, of changing the system is in the realm of ideas because people really don't have an idea of what a different system that would be good, that they'd want, is. Uh, And so as long as, you know, if the only choice is, you know, state-dominated communism or or what they called state socialism, but it was a system, a very repressive system, versus corporate capitalism, uh, if if that's all there really is possible, then, you know, we're in a pretty bad place. So I think it's very important, and indeed I've written one book on it, I'm writing another book on this, and many other people are working on and writing about this, to say, look, if you don't like corporate capitalism and you don't like state socialism, what do you want? And begin to answer the question. And what I think is possible, uh, and I'll give you a couple of websites on this as well, I think it's possible to begin at the ground level, and in most political economic systems are really they revolve around who owns the wealth because that's where the power comes from. So, for instance, in feudalism, the lords and the, and the church and the king owned the land and they got the power from owning that wealth. Uh, in corporate capitalism, the owners of corporations largely dominate the political process uh, because of ownership of wealth. Uh, that was different in small business capitalism in the 19th century. It was a different, more much more populist form and most of the wealth was in small farms. But... That was a different different system. Um, in state socialism, the state owns the wealth and it concentrates power there. Well, the next system, um, in my view, and I wrote a book called America Beyond Capitalism recently, I think we should start at the bottom and say, whatever can be decentralized, we decentralize. So what does that mean? Co-ops, co-ops around the country, we, I just mentioned there are 140 million people are already members of co-ops, and worker co-ops are popping up everywhere around the country now. Uh, all kinds of co-ops are, are growing. But that's a very decentralized, democratic ownership of wealth as opposed to corporate or private ownership of wealth. But it's at the grassroots level. So if you move up another level, city-owned public utilities 
are another form, and city land trusts. 800 cities own hospitals, and people don't know that. And many cities own companies that capture methane from the garbage and turn it into electricity. So it's city-owned companies. So you can imagine a whole series of, at the next level up, of city-owned developments. Uh, you, there's no reason not to mix small private firms in this and entrepreneurs and inventors, and we can have a lot of that if the system is established properly. There's room for that as well. And if you go to the next level, there, there's room for state ownership in certain cases. Uh, indeed, a hundred and uh, another uh, there's state. I mentioned that the state bank of North Dakota already exists, and there's 20 states thinking of doing that, or at least have legislation pending. Uh, introduced to set up a state-owned bank so that the profits go to the go to the public and and and, and kind of offset taxes, and the you can use the state bank to invest in worker-owned companies and co-ops and you know much more kind of in, inst- institutions that are both democratic but also don't get up and move. They kind of stabilize the communities in which they live. That's a point I w- you ought to just to note. Worker-owned companies. Um, are owned by the people who live in this community, so they rarely just get up and move, whereas big corporations often come into a city, get a big tax break from the mayor, stay for a while until the, the tax break essentially runs out, and then they move on, disrupting jobs and so forth. So building up worker-owned companies has a positive, another positive aspect. I think we're going to see uh, state ownership. I think one of the most important industries that people don't think about is the healthcare industry, which is you know almost 20% of the economy, and in some states I think we're going to see a single payer healthcare. Well, what is single payer? It's a, essentially a public, publicly owned insurance company as opposed right. to a privately owned insurance company. Medicare is a publicly owned insurance company, and I think we're going to move over time to you know if over time to that form in many many states. Uh, and if the whole healthcare system were actually to go in that direction, we're talking about uh, you know twenty percent of the economy. Uh, right. Or, so there's very significant possibilities. Uh, so when my the way I envision you ask what the next system would be would I think start at the Catholic Church has a term for this, which is uh, which suggests that everything be decentralized to the extent possible, and only go to a larger level if absolutely necessary. So some things have to be regionalized, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a huge regionally right. owned public institution. Uh, I think some of these big corporations, we saw General Motors, Chrysler, and AIG, the largest insurance company in the world, was nationalized temporarily at the last big crisis. And I think there'll be another big crisis and another one, and the government bails them out. At some point, there'd be no reason why some of these ought not, ought not stay in the public hands. So I right. think you can begin to see a whole, you know, multiple tiers. I call it a pluralist commonwealth, plural forms of common wealth ownership, the co-ops, neighborhood corporations, city ownership, state ownership, some regional, some national, not a centralized system, but a highly decentralized system, that begins to uh, you know respect American values and build on American experience, and we don't have to sign on to the tired old alternatives of state socialism, communism versus corporations. Uh, we can be creative about the next system, uh, and I really would uh, urge that. Uh, let me give you a couple of websites. Uh, one Great, is, thank you. One is uh, www.democracy uh, community dash wealth. Put the dash in dot org okay. community dash wealth and you'll you'll find a lot of practical ex- uh, work. The next one is, is that dot is, org. Yes, dot org. Okay. Community dash wealth dot org, and it really just reports on all these kinds of things that are popping up around the country that I'm summarizing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one that, that is America Beyond Capitalism, one word, and and that'll get you to my website, America Beyond Wet Capitalism, Ooh, and the third it. one. A third dot org again, and the third one mm-hmm. uh, is this is it one long word: pluralist commonwealth. Pluralist, pluralist co- commonwealth. Okay. One word, and that'll dot get org. you to kind of vision of the next system and theory of the next system and all sorts of writing about the kind of system that's neither corporate capitalism nor state socialism. So, um, and America Beyond Capitalism will give you some of that as well. The book. 
Excellent, excellent. Uh, mm-hmm. Kian? You know, I'm I'm starting to see from this conversation a, a recurring theme, if you will, from uh, from the book and the film also touched on this as well, uh, how deepening economic and social inequality produces the kind of conditions necessary from which various form, various new forms of democratization, ownership, wealth, and institutions begin to emerge. Um, yes, yes, indeed. You talk about more than, or like you mentioned how uh, earlier, how 140 million Americans, which is more than 40% of the population, are members of cooperatives. And um, you also state in the book the cur- about the current goal of worker ownership should be to build communities designing them to include public utilities which sustain which sustain them for the long term period. Uh you br- you bring up the example of Ohio, which I honestly didn't know this, uh was more than half uh which is home to more than half a million worker owners. And where the support system is developing work with cooperatives uh, is the most advanced in the nation. Um what lessons can we learn from communities like Cleveland, Ohio, where uh, you bring up how a group of worker-owned companies are connected to a community-building nonprofit corporation and a revolving fund designed to help such businesses thrive. Well, that's that's another example, it's, and it's a very good example that you bring up uh, of how things can evolve. Uh, so let me give you kind of two parts of the story. Um, and, and it's a way to think about history as well and, and how we change the system, if you like. Um, in 1977, there was a major steel mill in Youngstown, Ohio, called Youngstown Sheet and Tube, um, that 5,000 people lost their jobs in one day in September 1977 at Youngstown Sheet and Tube. This big steel company closed. Now, in 1977, that was huge news because people didn't, that hadn't happened. It was public the front page of the newspapers, television, etc. 5,000 people lost their job in one day. Uh, now, it happens every day now, so it's not news, but then it was. And uh, the steel workers there and the local townspeople, uh, that was devastating, not only, not only to the workers but to the town because it depended on that mill. And they, they rallied and said, you know, well, if they're going to close the mill, why don't we take it over and run it ourselves? Um, and they they got serious about it and organized the whole campaign, and they got the government to provide some money for a a very sophisticated study of how to do it, and which was done by top experts in the field, and they began campaigning uh, to, you know, to set up a worker-owned steel. It was very dramatic. It was front, that also was front-page news around the country and on television because that hadn't, you know, that hadn't happened. Anybody steel workers saying, "Let's take it over." Yeah. Uh, so it became a kind of, and the churches began supporting it, and it became a kind of cause for a while. And the Carter administration was forced to say, "Well, okay, we'll give you." Uh, you, we've done your, you've done the study. The steel experts say this is viable. Uh, okay, we'll give you what you're asking for, which is uh, loan guarantees to finance two hundred million dollars in loan guarantees to finance it. Um, and then after the election of 1978, not surprisingly, the money disappeared, uh, primarily because we, you know, so far as we can tell, the big steel companies went to the White House and opposed it, uh, and also. The major labor, labor union, the International Steel Workers, opposed it. The local guys wanted it, but the international uh, didn't want it, and they also didn't want these upstarts, local steel workers who were activists. They thought, well, you know, we just we don't want anybody challenging the national leadership. So that's 30 years ago, or more than 30 years ago now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the people who were doing that, they knew, and this is the real lesson for activists, they were aware they might lose that fight. And they understood that the important thing was that the fight go on. So they they really had built an education campaign into their fight. To, you know, whether or not we win or lose, we're going to educate the pu- the public for the next fight. So that's why you find you know, lots more worker-owned companies in Ohio today uh, than you find in many states because people learn the idea. And at Kent State University in Ohio, there's a center which helps set up worker-owned companies that came out of this crisis in the Youngstown fight in 1977, so that the attitudes and ideas are an important part of this and people fighting for the long... The same thing with civil rights. If you look at the people in the 1930s and 40s, they kept losing, but they spread the idea that the civil rights was important and one day it you know, was enough 
it came to, to fruition because of some of the groundwork they did. Well, that that brings you to you know what happened in Cleveland recently, and, and it, this is really part of the evolutionary development that's happening in many parts of the country and different things, different kinds of democratic ownership. But Cleveland has taken the idea of worker ownership to a whole new level. Uh, and as you say, what it amounts to, this is in one of the poorest neighborhoods of Cleveland, about 40,000 people with maybe you know $20,000 average family income and maybe 40% unemployment and mostly black neighborhood, a very poor neighborhood. In that neighborhood, you find a complex cooperative structure. And I say complex because it, uh, you mentioned it, but I'll describe it in a little more detail. The idea is to build the community. So that means a nonprofit corporation for the entire community, but also to set up worker-owned companies that are subordinated to, part of, owned by the nonprofit as well as the workers. So they they can't run up and go. They are part of the structure, and they are financed initially by the nonprofit, which gets loan and support money from from uh, foundations and banks and government loans, etc. That's the structure: worker-owned companies, but who are part of a larger structure to build the community. Uh, and the on top of that, and this makes it very interesting, in that same neighborhood are. Big, big hospitals and universities, the Case Western Reserve universities there, um, university hospital system, and then uh, the famous Cleveland Clinic is all in the middle of this neighborhood. And those nonprofits, now in any city, there are many, many cities like that with big hospitals and universities right in the middle of poor areas. They purchase, in this particular case, $3 billion, with a B, not an M, dollars in goods and services a year. These three alone. None of it from the neighborhood. So, you know, light bulb went on. Why don't we begin to try to orient some of the purchasing power of these big institutions, all of which have taxpayer money, medical, Medicare, Medicaid, education money, target it to these companies and build up a complex that will not get up and run the way many corporations come in just for a tax break and then leave the city high and dry. These these are going to stay. Workers, worker-owned companies don't go anywhere. That's because they, you know, the folks are doing and live there. And begin to target some of these purchases uh, to this complex. Uh, and that's going on in Cleveland today. And you know, these are not small co-ops, these worker co-ops. One of them is the largest industrial-scale green, urban greenhouse in the United States, three million heads of lettuce a year is its productive capacity. It's a, it's a huge, very high-tech operation. Worker complex owned. It's a multi-stakeholder owned, as they say. It's, it's complex, but largely cooperative. Another is a very large-scale industrial laundry, uh, servicing hospitals and nursing homes primarily, which uh, is the greenest laundry in that part of the country. And it's uh, you know, use about a third of the heat and a third of the water. Everything is green uh, water by design. Um, and the third is a solar installation installation company that does large scale and in, uh, industrial scale uh, solar. Again, owned by the workers as part of this complex. And they're they're trying to add on two new companies a year. So that whole structure, it's called the Evergreen Cooperatives, uh, and it's complex. It what what it is is an advanced over time as evolution of ideas to a more sophisticated level than just co-ops. It's it's a much more community-building idea and using these larger institutions to help stabilize the, the companies. That's happening in many parts of the country now because the people have said, hey, look what's going on in Cleveland. Uh, in Ohio, they're doing something in Cincinnati. They're doing things in the Washington, D.C. area similar to this. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Pittsburgh is exploring this. Uh, even in Amarillo, Texas, there's an effort to do something like this. Many, many cities, over 100 cities have made inquiry into how to do this, and, and a number of them are, are developing. So you get both you get the both increase in numbers, largely because nothing else is working. The pain levels are very high in these cities, and you know you can't start up a company, you know, small business, and usually the guy, if he makes any money, runs out to the suburbs, leaving the city high and dry or uh, big companies come in and, and uh, get the tax break and then leave. And unemployment doesn't change much anyway. 
So largely because of the pain levels and the failure, people are really looking at new new answers like this uh, highly complex, sophisticated, uh, democratically owned structure. Uh, and I think we're going to see much, much more of this for the same reasons, both the increase in numbers, but also increase in sophistication that go even beyond this uh, very complex and interesting uh, innovation in Cleveland. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly encouraging to know that, I mean, it can't last such economic inequality and uh, pain can't last forever. And it, and history does reflect that it, that it won't, but, um, do you expect, or do you and uh, vice versa, should we expect a volatile, maybe even violent reaction from uh, corporate ca- from corporate capitalists who stand to lose so much from such democratization? Well, um, we'll see about that. Uh, I think what happens in you know city by city, it's uh, it's it's very different from you know assaulting corporations head-on at the national level where they have all the power. When you actually go to a city like uh, Cleveland and you find, find lots and lots of people and the, and the mayor finding this very positive, when it's integrated into community life, it's, it's one, it isn't that big a threat to any one corporation yet, but also if you've got the people behind you in a locality, um, it's not so obvious who's going to win. And Cleveland you know, went through a huge fight several years ago about uh, they were trying to the, the municipal enter, municipal utility was a question of whether or not it would be privatized or not. And the, the, the citizens supported public um, against the big utilities. So if you're beginning to think about it one by one, uh, step by step, the same thing, that, as I mentioned, happened in Boulder. Uh, yes, if you try to nationalize Exxon tomorrow, you'd probably find the big corporations would win tomorrow. But if you build up steadily, step by step, from co-ops and worker-owned companies and municipalization over time, you may find uh, that patience and hard work begins to build you a power base that's not so easily assaulted. So uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm as a historian, uh, I'm not, I'm not impressed by people who say nothing can change. If you look at things over a few decades, the the record of massive change, even against high odds uh, and overwhelming power is very, very common in world history. Uh, it's not not always. People do lose. It isn't true that, you know, it's possible that nothing can be done. That is a real possibility. But I'm uh, skeptical of people who haven't thought about how how big the possibilities for change are uh, in, in the way of looking at other countries and even looking at our own history of what can be done, what has been done. Um, and of course, if you assume from the start that you can't win, you're, then you go, then you don't start, and you, you lose Absolutely. because you didn't act. I sometimes say people have a vested interest in pessimism. Uh, why a vested <laughs> interest? Because you don't have to do anything if you believe nothing can be done, right? It's a good thing to convince yourself that you can't win. You might as well do nothing. It's a good excuse. I love that. Great. I really love that. <laughs> now, let me tell you. Um, I love what you said before also because that is actually the, the move to men, mothers of Irandi. And we really try, first of all, on the grassroots level to accomplish things. In other words, community-based, one at a time. And that way, by the time uh, folks are cognizant of the changes that are occurring, it has already happened. So, I mean, I, I see your point perfectly. But, Dr. Alperovitz, um I'm sure you're familiar with Tom uh, Tom Hartman's book, The Crash of 2016. It, you know, it has a rather present online forward that says the following, and I'm going to be quick since we're starting to run low on time now. It goes as follows. Although we're in the midst of what could become the most catastrophic economic crash in American history, a way forward is emerging just as it did in the previous great crashes of 1760, 1850, 1856, and 1929. The choices we make now will redefine American culture. Before us stand a genuine opportunity to embrace the moral motive over the profit motive and to rebuild the American economic model that once yielded great success. You've said an economic collapse is not as likely as the one in 1929 because of a higher floor. Now, irrespective of severity of, of the severity of collapse, from your view of history, is the U.S. economic system likely to collapse, revive, or stagnate, or none of the above? Well, I, I think that the what's interesting about this period, um, and is I don't think you're going to get a classic 
uh, collapse, that like the a Marxist collapse uh, or a collapse like the 1930s. Um, and by the way, if it if it collapsed in that way, uh, the the right wing would probably win, not the left. Most people right. think that. Yeah, you know, we were very lucky in 1929 that it was a Republican president in office, so he took the blame. It could just as well have been a Democrat, and then you would have had a right wing government. So people need right. to think carefully about all that. What I think is interesting about the current context is that you know the. The government's share of the economy is now about 32 to 34 percent, depending upon whether you're the, 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 whether you're in recession or not, or the scale of the economy changes. So the government doesn't change, but but the denominator of the fraction changes. So say 32 to 34 percent. It was 11 percent in 1929. The floor of the government floor holding up the economy. So I think that it's very hard to get the kind of collapse that you had in 1929. Uh, I think you get stagnation and you get severe recessions, but that's different, and it's it's very different kind of pain. And I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing, uh, from the point of view of, of progressive change. And the reason is this: if it collapsed, as I say, I think it would not necessarily go in the direction you want. Right. Furthermore, even if the progressive side won, in a collapse, they don't know what to do with it. They, there's not enough development of an alternative that would actually solve problems. People in a crisis, in fact, often don't have a clue of what the answer is. It's and That certainly was true of the Roosevelt administration. They, they try anything, and experimentation, experimentation. <laughs> they on the other hand, at the wall. everything at the wall, see what's stuck, yes. On the other hand, in a rolling crisis of stagnation and unemployment and recession, the kind we now have, what people have... The, the the one of the only good things about that is people have time to learn how to do things at the local level. It's not easy to set up a worker-owned company or a municipal company or a state-owned bank. You need to learn how to do that. And I think that the that the process of developing and learning and building democratic structures is a very very important process so that you have a democratic outcome rather than something that's pasted in at the top in the middle of a crisis. So the positive side of, of the emerging context is that we may learn from all of this experimentation going around the country at, at every level, and we've just touched on a few, but it's in many, many different areas. It's in the healthcare system, it's in agriculture, it's in you know food distribution, many, many areas. The kind of experimentation we're talking about is is popping up. It's called the New Economy Movement by most people now. We're learning principles which I think can be advanced and inform and give real meaning to national solutions as the time develops. So I think we're in a period where we are, you know, many people say that before the New Deal, the better parts of the New Deal were de developed in the state and local, quote, laboratories of democracy in states like uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, and people are testing different ideas that the, the same principles that were tested at the state and local level later became principles nationally like social security and labor law reform and welfare programs all that was tested at the state and local level before it went national and i think that's what the other thing is very important about the experimentation now that we're, we may learn enough to go to, to another level uh with a vision that that really is democratic rather than that's stuck in in the middle of a crisis something pasted in in the middle of a crisis so is almost it, by definition not going to be very democratic excellent can you help yeah, I think it's uh, definitely common knowledge to anyone that's working uh, working in the movement to bring about systemic change. It's going to take – this is a process that will take decades uh, to accomplish. And, I mean, you've warned that even in the, if the next financial crisis, which many see as an inevitability, uh, we decide to break up too big to fail banks, uh, their history – suggests that they will simply regroup and reconcentrate, just like AT&T and elements of the old Standard and Oil did in previous areas. Yes. Um, they'll, they'll eventually have to be taken over. Uh, how, do you, how do we decentralize these corporate behemoths? In other words, how does a country transition from the mega factories? 
Well, it, it's uh, first. I, you know, I'm glad you brought up this because uh, I think the next crisis in banking, you know, people may be angry enough to, to break them up. That's the common nostrum. Of, you know, that's a lot of Democratic senators are calling for that. But they will probably regroup, and then after that, we're back to if breaking them up doesn't work, uh, and regulating them certainly doesn't work. Then the only thing left is to take them over, turn them into public utilities, nationalize them. I'd like to remind people that that argument was not a liberal argument. That was put forward by some of the most conservative economists of the Chicago School of Economics who understood that these giant corporations were going to really run things for their own benefit, not the public. They they believe in a free enterprise competitive system, which may or may not have been possible. I I have doubts that it. I think they always turn into corporate capitalism. Wait, are you saying Milton Friedman... Was uh, are you saying Milton Friedman actually was for the nationalization of banks? Well, Milton Friedman, uh, I don't find him on record for that, but his uh, he certainly believed that regulation didn't work, and he certainly believed that breaking them up didn't work, and he believed in what was called the he supported explicitly what was called the Chicago Plan, which was a de facto nationalization of the banking system and the money system. Oh, okay, and, and his Thank uh, you for clarification. Yeah, and his and his primary teacher was the founder of the Chicago School of Economics. Was, was a man named Henry C. Simon, very famous economist. Uh, made the argument that if you many many Chicago School economists who were did, believed you couldn't regulate the corporations, that was very common. As people won a Nobel Prize for that, because they were you know it was obvious the, reg, the big corporations would take over the regulator regulators and 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 de facto they would really control the system. And they also believed that you couldn't break them up. If you broke them up, they'd regroup. These are conservative arguments, not liberal arguments, and they were made very often. That left, uh, as Henry C. Simon pointed out, that leaves you only one option, that which is for big ones, not for small business, but for big ones, is to nationalize them. So, yes, it explicitly, in the banking system and in general, a number of leading conservative economists at the Chicago School of Economics argued that Making the nationalization was the only answer in such cases, and I think they were right. Um, you know, the socialists and liberals made the argument on other grounds, but in a way, the Chicago School of Economics argument is is the most easily understood uh, argument uh, for taking over very big companies uh, for the reason that they can't be regulated de facto. They've got so many lobbyists. Banking bankers have so many lobbyists in Washington. You I mean it's unbelievable to see the money spent on lobbying um and and the small business they if you break them up they regroup and this is just pretty the statistics are pretty clear so that only leaves public ownership is the only way to do it and i think that's right. understandable i love to hear you say that but uh, we're kind of running low on time so kian is down to the 52 minute time uh, kian? uh yeah in our I just wanted to kind of go back or go to your uh, your own organization, Democracy Collaborative. Um, in our current phase, in move to men's current phase of movement building, we seek to empower others by giving them the tools and resources they need to become organizers and to help their help educate their neighbors at the local level. Uh, how does the Democracy Collaborative use its tools and resources to mobilize people to democratize ownership of their economy? Uh, what is this, what is your strategy for transforming the current economy to one which strengthens and stabilizes people? Well, the uh, you know what we what we've attempted to do is you know with every no one has significant enough the resources to do what you really want to do, but we've attempted to develop models that can be replicated. So that the one in Cleveland is really an important model that's now people. People have got the idea that that model was done you know essentially top down. It was the only way to do it. But that was not the goal. The goal was to give people an idea of what they could do bottom up, and and that's really what's happening just by virtue of setting an example. And, and we're you know delighted to see that. That was our hope all along. Cincinnati would be a good example of taking the same principles and starting and developing it through organizing. We also provide information. Those websites on trying to collect information and disseminate it, what you what you can do because somebody else is doing it. For instance. Uh, some cities, Richmond, California, is now using eminent domain in the housing crisis. That's the power of the city to threaten uh, taking over housing, which, for, which they do all the time for commercial purposes, but they can do it in a way, uh, Richmond argues, uh, to help solve the housing crisis. So we try to pass in information around, and uh, that's the second, second way of doing it. And we, we write as much as we can. 
if we we're, we're trying to get more resources to give technical assistance to some places to you know what, on the basis of what we learn in various projects uh so that's a third way and then you know getting on the lecture circuit the uh, talking with folks like you on the radio if we can um uh, making films whenever we can uh, spreading the word um whatever we can do to try to to whatever we can learn from what's going on around the country to pass it on is is kind of what we try to do we try to also develop policy in state local and national policies that would uh, accelerate this process um the list is endless the uh, unfortunately the resources aren't endless but the the things that ought to be done are ex- extraordinarily large and we try to do whatever we can Excellent, Dr. Uh, Perovitz. I mean, um, uh, there's so much more for us to talk about. I wish we could, but we're down to the last three and a half minutes. So why don't you take the opportunity now to make any final comments you have, and please be sure to let folks know how to get involved. And in in, in about a minute and a half or so, why don't you also touch on um, the Supreme Court, uh, how the Supreme Court plays a role in all that we're doing? Well, let me say that briefly because that that could be a long discussion. It's obvious the court decisions have been extremely corporate oriented, uh, and they're not going to change until we change the court. We're not going to change that until we change the government um, who makes the appointments. So, but that's that's a huge fight. Uh, probably the best thing I can do is just remind people of where you can get more information. So, um, if you go, I'll mention again my book, America Beyond Capitalism, which is easy to remember. But also, if you string those words together, americabeyondcapitalism.org, you get to my website, and there's a lot of resources and articles and links to lots of other things there. Um, my most recent book, uh, which which is is What Then Must We Do? What Then Must We Do is the title of the book, and it's uh, you know it's what's called Straight Talk Towards a New America Revolution is a subtitle. Uh, towards a community sustaining economy what then must we do though it's available on paperback it's uh, you can get it hardback or you can get it electronically um, and uh, i think that's the best summary of what we've been talking about uh another website just that you know kind of surveys the field and puts you in touch with actual practical things going on around the country again to mention it is called uh, it's common community dash wealth put the dash in dot org community dash wealth and that'll just lead you to many 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 examples which we keep updating uh of what's going on in these different areas around the country um you mentioned the film that i did which you can also find just by going to my website uh, because i say america beyond capitalism one word will get you to the website and there's a, a film there that's a video which you can get free for use or use in training programs um and you know lots of links to other i guess lectures i've given or talks other people in our organization have given um pretty much whatever you, those three, those three websites will get you there well thank you very much dr aparovic we'll have all those links at our website as well and in, in in the blogs we so wish we had more time to speak with you but we ran very low because again it was quite interesting and informative kia absolutely I, it was a Honored to talk with you, Dr. Alpervitz, and hopefully we can have you again on back on the show or working with us in the future. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I, I appreciate what you guys have been doing. The whole efforts are very important. Thank you very thank much, you. sir. It has it's been our honor. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a quick couple of comments before we get or before we go, folks. Um, Next week, Move to Amends, David Cobb will be barnstorming in New York from May 28th through June 7th. For dates and locations, visit movetoamend.org slash barnstorming. Click on 2014 schedule. And don't forget to help support the Move to Amend, uh, Move to Amend reports and other Move to Amend campaigns by joining our $28 for the 28th Amendment monthly sustainer campaign. Uh, you can also learn more about p- corporate personhood, money as protected political speech, and about these campaigns and other ways to get involved with Move to Men by visiting movetomen.org. Uh, next week, we'll be talking with Maryland State Senator Jamie Raskin about the power of corporations and unions. Please join us. Thank you very much, Kian. Folks, this has been one more edition of Move to Men Reports. We hope you enjoyed the uh, conversation. 
please remember to visit us at move to amend.org. You guys have a wonderful day, and Kian, thank you very much. Thank you, Egberto. Have a great night, everyone. You too. Bye-bye.